Well, Peter says, even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Christian, don't do good in this world seeking a blessing from the world. Don't do it because you're hoping the world will somehow notice and praise you and do good in return. In fact, you can often expect, as Peter says, the opposite. But even if you should suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Don't live a good life as a Christian and follow Christ so that you might receive a blessing from the world. Do it because you are blessed in Christ. No matter what the world might do in response, you remain blessed by Christ because of his great gifts and his love. Live in love. Do good because you are blessed. This message is from Rock of Ages Lutheran Church in Payson, Arizona. 1 Peter 3, 13-22 Have you ever done something good for someone? only to have them lash out against you? It seems apparent one of the pets in our household has that problem. You see, my son has a pet hedgehog, and sometimes the hedgehog likes to make a point of making it known he's not happy about something, even when you try to help him. For example, my, my son will be feeding him or holding him or trimming his nails, and the hedgehog will prick him with one of his quills. Or maybe when the cage has been cleaned, does the, does the hedgehog say thank you? No, it just grumbles and complains. Or after my son has given his hedgehog a bath, the hedgehog looks and stares back with its perturbed little hedgehog eyes as if to say, if you ever do that again, I will murder you. Maybe you know the feeling. Maybe you've done something good for somebody and felt like you were doing it for a hedgehog. That is, you did something good for them, but they just spurned you and made a point to insult you or show some form of malice in response. Well, Peter says that's actually the case for us as God's people, that as we do good, we can expect the world will give us a hard time. Peter says, you will suffer for what is right. And he also says that as we do good, the world will speak maliciously against our good behavior in Christ. It will slander us. So how are we to respond when it feels like we're being spurned because of the good that we do? We see our answer as we look at 1 Peter once again going through our series as we see how God carries us from cross to crown. And as we look now at the second part of chapter 3, we see how Peter tells us, instructs us to, in all times, confess the crucified and risen Christ. We do that even in a world that spurns us. Peter starts this section by saying, Who is going to harm you if you're eager to do good? And the answer you'd expect is, well, nobody. But in fact, the world will turn against people who do good, including the good that Christians do to love and to serve those around them in this world. You know, a small example of that recently, it was really just a nuisance, but what happened was somebody that was on our property looked like they maybe were experiencing homelessness. I hadn't seen them before, and actually haven't seen them since. But as I usually do, I walked up to him and introduced myself and asked if there's any way I could help him. He said that he just wanted some water. And so I also gave him the water and offered him some food to eat, which he eagerly accepted. I left to go run an errand, but when I came back, I found that the property was littered with some of his personal items and with the packaging of the food even though the garbage was just right around the corner. Now, this was just a nuisance. Sometimes our good will be responded with some sort of carelessness or indifference. But other times it can even include malice. Christians around the world and throughout history have experienced this. Peter writes to the ancient Christians in Asia Minor who are living a life serving God, showing love to those around them, and yet the world speaks against them. Can you imagine their frustration? 
Or consider what the Christian church has done throughout history. It has funded orphanages, hospitals, has helped feed the poor, established programs to help those who are in need. And yet, how does the world still sometimes respond against Christianity? It lashes out and it wrongly accuses them of not caring. Christians will support programs for pregnancy counseling centers and programs to help families that are in need, and yet the world will still wrongly accuse them of not caring about mothers. Christians will honor authority, but they'll be mocked for it. Christians will find themselves honoring marriage and have programs to support Christian homes and families, and yet the world will accuse them of being filled with hate. Wrongly so. And even though Christians will love this world more than a boy loves his pet hedgehog, the world will spurn them, poke at them, and make a point to cause them to suffer or give them some response of malice. How do you respond? How does a Christian continue to live in a world that's like that? Well, Peter says, even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Christian, don't do good in this world, seeking a blessing from the world. Don't do it because you're hoping the world will somehow notice and praise you and do good in return. In fact, you can often expect, as Peter says, the opposite. But even if you should suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Don't live a good life as a Christian and follow Christ so that you might receive a blessing from the world. Do it because you are blessed in Christ. And even if the world might lash out against you for living a good life in Christ, Peter adds, you're blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. No matter what the world might do in response, you remain blessed by Christ because of his great gifts and his love. Live in love. Do good because you are blessed. And then Peter goes on to describe how we live in this world and how we are to respond. As he says, in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. The Christian lets Christ reign over their lives. They live serving their God and their King, Jesus. And as Christ is in our hearts, he will also be on our lips. So Peter adds, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks to give you the reason for the hope that you have. We might find as we live a good life and as we confess our faith and continue to follow Christ in this world, maybe the world will notice. And they'll, they'll wonder at some point, why, Christian, do you do what you do? Why do you continue to do good despite what the world says and does? What makes you tick? And you have an opportunity to give a response, to confess your faith. And notice Peter, he doesn't say, be ready to give an answer to those nice people around you. He says, always be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you. To confess Christ. To confess the source of your hope in this world to everyone, including those who might spurn you or make it a point to insult you or speak against you. And then Peter goes on to describe for us here, for the rest of the chapter, how this is done. And he gives us our confession, really following all the parts of the Apostles' Creed, which describe Christ as he goes from cross to crown. This is our hope. This is our confession. Listen to the confession he makes. But first note, Peter says, do this with gentleness and respect. As you confess Christ, our hope, as you confess your Lord Christ, do you do it with gentleness? See, there might be times where we confess Christ, but maybe we'll do it in such a way that we put down the world of people around us who are lost in sin. And maybe at times the Christian might be tempted to give some sort of derisive label or, or nickname to the unbelieving world around us. To label them as the enemy and put them down in shame rather than to confess Christ, to bring them from shame to forgiveness. This world which is lost and which needs the, the waters of life, the gospel of Christ. It needs us to co confess Christ and it needs us to do it with gentleness. As a humble, lowly sinner, 
one who needs God's mercy and who shares God's mercy. And no, gentlemanness doesn't mean that we tolerate wickedness and evil, but it means the way we approach the world around us is to be with the attitude of humility and concern for the lost. Do you? Do you always confess Christ with gentleness or do you sometimes find yourself speaking in arrogance and in pride to the unbelieving world around you, the world which spurns you? Peter adds, with gentleness and respect. Now this could mean respect to the person you're trying to reach with your confession. But the word more literally means fear, meaning fear of God. Christian, as you speak to the world around you about Christ as your Lord and you confess your hope, you should do it gently. But you should also do it as you look to your God in total reverence and fear. That is, once again, without arrogance or pride. Do you? When you confess your faith to the world around you, is it sometimes lacking gentleness because of your own arrogance and pride? Or is it sometimes lacking in fear and reverence of God because of your own arrogance or pride? Confess Christ as Lord. Confess your hope in him, but do it with gentleness to those around you and with reverence for God. For you are a lost and found sinner who has been brought back to God. Peter then describes our confession, one which we are to share in gentleness and reverence and fear. He says, Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body. Notice how our confession begins. Peter is, as I said, going to outline for us the Apostles' Creed from cross to crown. We confess, first of all, he says, the righteous one. We confess the holy Son of God who did no wrong, and yet he suffered. Who only sought to do good, and in his godly behavior spoke the truth, had compassion for those around him, healed, and yet he suffered. If ever we begin to wonder if something good might come out of doing good, even though we suffer, look to Christ. And look how God blessed not only his son, but the whole world through him. We confess our hope is in the Holy Son of God, the sinless son who suffered and who died. And our confession goes on as Peter says why he did that. Christ suffered once for sins. Though he was holy and without sin, we confess he died for our sins. You see, this brings our gentleness and our reverence that Christ did suffer, but it was for us and for our sin. And we are labeled as the unrighteous. We see a beautiful exchange that we confess, that the righteous, holy Son of God suffered for the unrighteous sinner, for you, for me, for the people who speak maliciously against you, for all unrighteous. This is our confession. He did this for our sins, to bring us to God, that the barrier and division of sin would be gone, and the malice and hostility removed, and we'd be brought back to our God. And this is our confession. We confess the holy, righteous Son of God, crucified and died. Christ, his victory over sin for us. And then Peter goes on. He describes Christ's journey from cross to crown. This is our confession. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in spirit. Jesus lowered himself and died, but he also now has been lifted up. He is glorified. And though, yes, he has a body, he is exalted. That is what it means here by made alive in spirit. Jesus, now risen, has conquered death. We confess the Holy Son of God who suffered and died for us and for our sin. We confess Christ's victory over sin, and we see also we confess Christ who won the victory for us over death. And then Peter goes on to describe our confession as he says, after being made alive, he went and made a proclamation to the imprisoned spirits. This is part of our confession in the Apostles' Creed when we say, 
he descended into hell. And Jesus didn't descend into hell to give the devil a second chance. He didn't descend into hell so that the, the souls that had been lost before might repent and be saved. No, he descended into hell to make a proclamation of his victory. This was part of Christ's victory parade over the devil and all of the forces of evil and all the enemies of God. And so we confess our hope is in Christ, the Holy Son of God, who was crucified and who died for our sins. He won the victory over sin. He rose again and won the victory over death. And we confess our hope is in Christ, who won the victory over all of our enemies and all the forces of evil. Peter goes on to describe how we receive the blessings and benefit of our Christ as he describes the means by which God blesses us. He says, Jesus proclaimed his victory to the imprisoned spirits and those, those who disobeyed long ago in the days of Noah and describes how God saved Noah in the flood as God lifted up Noah in the ark during the flood. Peter says, that rescue, that, that saving of Noah was by God's means as Noah trusted in God Properly speaking, it was God who rescued him, not the ark. Peter says, we have a rescue. And God's means is baptism. He says twice here, baptism saves you. You see, after Jesus rose again from death, he told his disciples, go and baptize all nations and teach them to make disciples. Baptism saves you. And properly speaking, it's not the water that saves us, but the power of the word of God and his promise which saves us. Peter is the one who spoke on Pentecost and said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, and you will receive for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and for your children and for all. So Peter can rightly say, Baptism saves you. And it's not merely an outward washing. It's God giving us the pledge of a clear conscience. That is, he promises our sins are taken away. And we have righteousness before our God. Baptism saves you not by some outward washing, but he says it saves you by the resurrection of Christ. You see, connected to Christ, we follow him from cross to crown. And in the waters of baptism, God has connected us to our Lord. And whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. This is God's promise. It is the chosen means he has given us as we trust in him. And then Jesus, who rose again, told his disciples, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. So Peter continues our confession. Our confession is the same as the Nicene Creed, one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And it goes on to describe who Christ is now. Christ has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. Here is our confession and our hope. We confess Christ who not only rose again, not only declared his power over the devil and sent us out with baptism as his means of rescue for all who believe, but also he has ascended into heaven and is now in glory. He has gone from cross to reigning on his throne. He is crowned in glory and he rules over all powers, including those who might threaten, who might mock, insult, or poke at Christians who do good and who confess Christ. We see our confession. It's all the way from cross to crown. It's centered on Christ. Yes, there will be times when this world will look down on you as you live your life in reverent fear, as you follow Christ, as you love those around you. It might make a point to cause malice or make you suffer. But fellow Christian, fellow foreigner, Jesus, our Lord, is our confession. And with gentleness and respect, continue to confess Christ as Lord. As we confess him who suffered and died, the righteous one, for our sins. And Jesus who rose again, not only winning the victory by taking our sins away, but taking away the curse of death. And we confess Christ who proclaimed his victory over the spirits 
in prison and over the devil and all the forces of evil. And we confess and have our hope in Christ, who after this sent out baptism as his means of rescue, baptism which saves you by the power of his word and his resurrection, so that whoever is baptized will be saved through faith in him. And he is now the Christ that we confess, who reigns on his throne, who, seated at the position of all authority, has been crowned in glory. This is the one we confess. And as we suffer for doing what is good, we are merely following Christ. Don't forget, if you suffer for doing good, you are blessed. Continue to revere Christ as Lord and continue to confess him to those around you with all gentleness and respect because we confess a Christ who suffered, died, on the third day, he rose again from the dead. He descended into hell. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. This is the Christ whom we follow in faith. Having been baptized and washed of our sins, we now follow him who leads us through the trials and through the sufferings from cross to join where he has gone to crown. And we will be there by his grace.